got a couple of practice problems for you to work on from seven. Wait, no, sorry. Eight, I guess. Before we get started. <clears throat> there you go. So figure out um, which mechanism and then predict the product. So we'll go ahead um, and get started on these um, two example problems and then we'll move back into chapter nine for addition reactions. Um, so, so we have, actually there's two questions here. So the first one um, is secondary alkyl halide to iodobutane. Which is actually chiral um, but we're not going to worry about um, the implications of stereochemistry too much with elimination reactions um, because it involves um, a lot of Newman projections and, and making sure that you have groups in the right spot um, with respect to size. And so it, it becomes a little bit more um, complicated than just predicting products. So 2-iodobutane which is, again, like I said, a secondary alkyl halide, which means all of the reactions are possible. Okay. 
the iodide is an excellent leaving group. So the reactions are all possible. And then when you look at your base and nucleophile, that would be written at the top. And that's the abbreviation for terse butoxide. And so there's two things that you should note about terse butoxide. You have a negative oxygen in that compound and that because of the size of the terse butyl group, it's very, um, it's a very big and bulky compound or ionic species. So that is considered a base. Because it's charged, it's considered a strong base. So at this point, these nuclei, uh, the substitution reactions, which would require a nucleophile, are less likely than elimination. If you want to ensure that you go by an SN2 reaction, so excuse me, an E2 reaction, then you use a stronger, a strong base, not a weak base. So this um, is leading you towards E2 elimination and then your solvent is polar protic and e eliminations really aren't picky about solvents anyway. So um, that supports an E2 mechanism. Now, one thing that you might be um, thinking is, well, in this particular case, um, you'd get the same product, whether it went by E1 or E2, maybe, maybe not. E1 almost always goes by uh, to form the product that would be called the Zaitsev product. E2, you can manipulate whether you get the Hoffman product or the Zaitsev product by the size of the base. So since this is a big bulky base, E2 eliminations are going to make the Hoffman product, which means you need the least substituted alkene. So that would be that product and would have pulled a proton from that carbon. Are there any questions about the first example before we move to the second example? Oops. Okay. So we'll do something similar in the, in the bottom reaction. This time we have a tertiary alkyl halide. Oh gosh, what did I do? There we go. Tertiary alkyl halide. This one's not chiral. Two iodo, two methyl pentane. Tertiary alkyl halides cannot participate in SN2 reactions. Okay. This sp3 hybridized carbon is too blocked to allow a nucleophile to reach this partially positive or this carbon participating in the polar bond. Tertiary alkyl halides do make nice carbocations, stable carbocations. So both SN1 and E1 are in, uh, must be considered, as well as E2, because all a base needs to do for an E2 elimination is bump into the outside of the um, substrate. So we can just go ahead and ignore the entire rest of the SN2 um, column. The leaving group is iodine, which is a very stable conjugate base. Now when we look up in over our arrow, we have methanol, which is, there's lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen. Methanol is considered both a weak nucleophile for SN1 as well as a weak base for E1. If you want E2, you need, like we said up here, a strong base. So this is out. This is polar protic, which supports SN1, but it doesn't discount E1. 
So the important part of this question is that if you have support of SN1, you also support E1. So you're going to get a mixture of products in this case. E1 eliminations tend to make the Zaitsev product primarily, it's the major product, oops. So that would be the elimination product, the major elimination product, and then your substitution product is an ether. Okay, are there any, <coughs> excuse me, questions about the second example? Okay, so we'll move on now into chapter nine. And chapter nine, ooh, the new pen, it's awesome. Chapter nine is addition reactions of alkenes. So addition reactions of alkenes have a general structure. And the general structure is that you have an alkene substrate. And it doesn't matter right now what these groups are. But you also have to remember that you can, you have two options essentially for getting to this point. If, the, if your reagent is commercially available, you could buy it. If it's not, you'd have to make it. And you would make your alkene by an E1 or E2 mechanism. Okay, so you have to remember, you can get to this point. This would be the point of the class. Can you make it, not can you buy it? Okay. Then what we do is we're going to add across the pi bond, okay? And what that means is that the carbons that are in red, these vinylic carbons, each get something new added. They're going to go from sp2 carbons to sp3 carbons. And right now we're just gonna say, we're gonna add x and y across the pi bond. X will go to one vinylic carbon, Y will go to the other. And then what we make is this product where we have lost the pi bond. Okay, so your product of addition reactions cannot be an alkene. You have to, and it may not necessarily just be an alkene, it may be a substituted alkene, you could make alcohols, um, di dialkyl halides, things like that, but you have to, you cannot show a pi bond here. So the reactive component of your alkene is your pi bond electrons. Okay, there's two electrons in that pi bond. And depending on what they grab is, will, will dictate what you call them. So for example, if you have these two different alkenes and the pi electrons grab a proton, then you're saying your alkene acts as a base. 
So it's an electron pair donor grabbing a proton. If your pi electrons grab an electrophile, your alkene acted as a, as a nucleophile. And both are possible depending on the reaction conditions. I'm going to um, switch my screen so I can show you that table 9.1 again from the textbook. And if you haven't done this yet in terms of um, making your flashcards, you need to do that today and work on these over the weekend. Because one of the hardest parts, um, you know, in my opinion, in this chapter is just that you have so many new words all of a sudden. Okay. So, and just to sort of give you a preview of where we're going, this first reaction here that is called the hydrohalogenation, one of the carbons gets a hydrogen and the other carbon is going to get a halide, so a bromine or a chlorine or an iodine. Depending on the reaction conditions, you can alter which carbon in the pi bond gets the hydrogen and which one gets the halogen. So in the hydrohalogenation reaction, there's two different types. Okay. In the hydration reaction, there's three different types. So this is sort of like the top branch of a tree or the, you know, the top part, and it's just going to get bigger as you go down. Okay. And each one of the mechanisms has certain rules. Um, so these names are going to be important that you understand because it's going to be easier for me to say we're going to do a hydration reaction than saying, okay, now again, we're going to add H and OH across the pi bond. So these names have to be um, understood in terms of what they represent in terms of a reaction. Okay, so before we go any further, like start looking at the reactions. There's a little bit of terminology that we need to work through. Okay. And the, that is sort of within this broad category of redox chemistry. Okay, now you've had redox chemistry before in um, some kind of second semester general chemistry course. So when you have a um, general chemistry course, you use the mnemonic oil rig to keep track of what's happening, which is that oxidation is loss and reduction is gain. And these are of electrons. So in general chemistry, these are electron transfer reactions. Now, the new way that you're going to have to think about this is with respect to organic reactions. And we don't transfer electrons to make ions. <clears throat> what we do is we have electron density loss or electron density gained. Okay. So when you're saying electron density, what you're really talking about is um, either adding or removing an electronegative atom from a carbon atom. Okay. So this electron density loss from a carbon atom is still called an oxidation. So now when we write this out for organic chemistry, oxidation is loss of electron density. 
okay? And we're focusing on our carbon. If you do a reduction of a carbon atom, the carbon atom is going to gain electron density. So the definitions really aren't changing. It's just that we're not doing a transfer to make ions. We're just shifting through polar bonds and nonpolar bonds where the electron density is with respect to a carbon atom. Great. So we're going to talk about the bonds that you can make and break so that your reaction is considered an oxidation the bonds that you can make or bake so that your reaction is a reduction. Okay. If you memorize or learn one, the other is the opposite. So oxidations are going to decrease electron density at a carbon. Reductions are going to increase electron density at a carbon. Okay. If you want to have an oxidation, you need to break carbon to hydrogen bonds. And you have to make carbon to oxygen, carbon to nitrogen, or carbon to halogen bonds. Okay. Reductions are the exact opposite. You're going to make carbon to hydrogen bonds. Oops, that's supposed to be a one. Or you have to break carbon to oxygen, carbon to nitrogen, carbon to halogen. Now at this point, because we've always throughout the term and even Chem 101 and 102, we've always said that carbon to hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. That's mostly true. Okay. So when you have your break in or discussing your bonds, if the difference in electronegativity is between zero and 0 0.5, you say they're nonpolar. Okay, nonpolar covalent. But if you do the subtraction, the electronegativity of carbon is 2.5. The electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. So there's actually a difference. It's not a purely nonpolar bond. It's mostly nonpolar. But if you break or make a carbon to hydrogen bond, there is a slight alteration to the polarity. Okay. But these still, these statements still hold true. And I would still expect that if you were asked about the polarity of an alkane hydrocarbon, you would say that it's nonpolar, even though there's this teeny tiny little bit. Depends on how like OCD you are, I guess. Questions about this, because we'll use these terminologies to say, okay, this reaction is an oxidation, and then this is what it will mean. If a reaction is a reduction, this is what it will mean. And again, these are probably things that you can just put on a flashcard, this information on one, this information on the other. Okay. All right. So if there aren't any questions, I'm going to erase this slide and we're going to move on. Okay. All right. The next thing that we're going to do before we get to reactions is we're going to talk about faces of alkenes. And this is important, highly important, when your substrate is a cycloalkene. So a ring with a pi bond in it. Now, drawing these 
is difficult because the intention, I mean, I can draw a, a, a pentagon fine, but you have to draw your pentagon in such a way that you're not looking at it from the top or the bottom. You have to sort of in your drawing, turn it so that you're looking at the bond head on, not from the top down, but straight on. And the way that you do this is you tend, I'm gonna use one of my fat markers I wanna throw away. You draw the bond that you're looking at thick, and then you draw the bonds going to the rest of the molecule just a little thinner so that you're looking right at this bond, which happens to be the pi bond. And then these are sp two hybridized carbons, so they each have one hydrogen on them. Okay, so we have sp2 trigonal planar carbon atoms. Okay. All right, now each of the carbon atoms is going to get a new thing. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to add a red box. And we're going to add a blue box. So those just represent some groups. Okay. So there are two ways that the red and the blue can be added to your um, alkane. Sorry, your alkane. Let me find my crap marker. Okay, so here's my thick bond, thick bond. And go back. Okay. All right. Now, if I'm going to draw this up, it's a little bit awkward, but up, down, up, up. So these red and blue shapes can either add to the same face or they can add to opposite faces. Okay, so back to the substrate, the top would be up here. So that's one face and the bottom would be down here that's the other face. It has a top side and a bottom side. And they just call them faces. So if you add on opposite faces, it's called an anti-addition. If you add them on the same side, it's called sin addition. And you can really only see this if your substrate is a, a, a cycloalkane. So sometimes it's going to be, we're going to have to use cycloalkenes as our substrates just so this point can be um, clearly made. The other issue is that you're very likely going to see new solvents in these reactions, new chemicals, <clears throat> and see some shortcut things. So ET2O, is diethyl ether. And if it's drawn out, if you're a swimmer, it looks like somebody doing the butterfly. Okay. Another one, CH2Cl2, it's called dichloromethane. Often abbreviated DCM. And it's just a standard tetrahedron. Okay. Acetone. Just the, a simple ketone. And then something called, it's abbreviated THF, it's called tetrahydroforane. You won't have to like draw these things, um, but if you just say, there's gonna be a couple reactions where we say, all right, well, we are gonna use 
boron trihydride in the THF solution. That's what it is. It's referring to a solvent called tetrahydroforane. So are there any questions about any of this introductory stuff before we start on um, hydrohalogenation? So we're going to start 9.3 with hydrohalogenation with respect to the regioselectivity. So remember, the regioselectivity is going to tell you on which carbon something happens. Okay. <clears throat> and the first thing we're going to look at is um, what happens if we use a symmetric alkene substrate. Okay. Now, with learning the names and memorizing and what these words tell you, hydrogen, hydro means hydrogen. Halogenation, a halogen is an X. So this is the addition of a hydrogen and a halogen across a pi bond. So if we use this particular cis alkene, and when I say it's symmetric, it has a plane of symmetry through the middle. So the left half of the molecule looks like the right half of the molecule, and the two vinylic carbons are equivalent. So we have two equivalent sp2 vinylic carbons. Okay. And if we add HBr, and this reaction has to be done under colder temperatures, so about minus 30 degrees Celsius. Okay. What you see is that you end up with about 70 some percent yield, making an alkyl halide. Okay. So one of these hydrogens is new and then the bromine is new. And what you can see here is we have no pi bond. Okay. So we've lost the pi bond in the formation of this product. Now this reaction, if we draw the mechanism for it, and in this chapter, if I show you a mechanism, you need to be able to replicate it. Um, these pi electrons are going to act as a base and grab the proton. kick off electrons to the bromine. Now what's happening here in this step is that the pi electrons in the bond will form a sigma bond from one carbon to the hydrogen. Okay, so one of these carbons is going to go sp2 to sp3 and have four bonds to it. The other one is going to go sp2 to sp2 carbocation. Okay. Now because these carbons are equivalent in the alkene, it doesn't matter where you put the um, carbocation, but because of the structure we have here, we'll put it over on this one. Okay. Now this bromide is in solution. And will attack the carbocation in a nucleophilic attack to make this product. 
So this is a two-step reaction. that requires you to form a carbocation. Okay, and that's very important. You must make a carbocation. This first step, where you put the carbocation, as long as this is uh, symmetric, won't matter. But if you use an asymmetric alkene substrate, it will matter. So if we now do the same reaction, but we use an asymmetric alkene, And we're still going to use HBr. Now what we have to do is we have to say, okay, where does the carbocation going to be Somebody's calling me. Where is the carbocation going to be after um, the acid base reaction? Lewis acid and base reaction. Okay, so let's draw the arrow. Okay, grabbing a proton, kicking off the bromide. I want you to look at these two carbons that are vinylic. This one is secondary. This one is tertiary. So which situation is better? Is it better to make a secondary carbocation or a tertiary carbocation? Which is more stable? So carbocation stability, remember, increases with the number of R groups or carbon atoms bonded to the, carbo the carbon carrying the positive charge. So the best place for the carbocation is going to be on the tertiary position. Okay. So you are always going to make in the hydrohalogenation reaction, always make the more highly substituted carbocation. Okay, now in this case, you would also have your bromide in solution that will attack and your product then looks like this. Now the evidence for this, or um, the justification for it, is easy to see if you draw an energy level diagram. So here we have energy, and then this is progress. Okay, so here are your reactants to go to products, okay? The step one is formation of a carbocation. So a secondary carbocation is higher in energy than a tertiary carbocation. That also means that the activation energy for formation of the secondary carbocation is higher. So the easier process, the cheaper process energetically is to make the tertiary carbocation. The second step then, which is nucleophilic attack, would be pretty fast down to your products.
So if we write this again, how it um, would look or could look is the HBR doesn't necessarily have to be drawn right here. It could be drawn in the front or it could just be shown on top of the reaction arrow. Okay. The important thing is that there's nothing written here. All right. There's no solvent indicated. that will tell you that this reaction product or this reaction will proceed to make the more highly substituted carbon. Now, when you do these reactions and you make the more highly substituted product, you're following what is called, squeeze it in here, Markovnikov's rule. Okay, and Markovnikov's rule is that in the hydrohalogenation, the halogen is placed at the more highly substituted Vinylic carbon. Okay. Now, again, remember you don't have vinylic carbons at the end, so you don't have a pi bond, but it's with respect to the identity of the substrate. Are there questions about the Markovnikov addition? This is what this is called Markovnikov addition of HBr to an asymmetric or a symmetric alkene. I have a quick question. Sure, Karen. The, how, the hydrogen, is it then hanging on to the secondary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so over here, remember, there's one hydrogen present to complete the octet for the, for the um, carbon that I don't have to show. So over here, that one is still there. And then this one is on that same carbon. I just don't have to draw them. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Any other questions with this? Okay, so we're going to make a couple notes on hydrohalogenation. So this is still 9.3. Okay, so hydrohalogenation. Okay, this is still regioselectivity. Markovnikov's rule. Plus the exception. So in this case, we're going to start with the same alkene. And depending on how you draw, your reaction arrow will tell you what will happen. Okay. So if you use HBr and underneath the arrow is empty, you make the Markovnikov product. Okay. This is a reaction that you must be able to draw the mechanism. And even though I don't get to see what you're drawing, you should be able to draw this. This reaction will proceed in the same way 
if you use HBR, HCL, or HI. Okay. We don't do fluorine, but those three, as long as nothing is written, will go and will go through to make a Markovnikov product. Now this path down here only works for HBR. So if you use hydrobromic acid and you put it into a solution that contains a peroxide. So peroxides are bonded in this fashion. So you have two oxygens single bonded to one another and then off to R groups. If the R groups are hydrogens, this is hydrogen peroxide. Okay. This is going to make what we call the anti-Markovnikov product. This reaction is um, radical in nature, and you have you don't need to know uh, no mechanism. So a mechanism, remember, is an arrow diagram that shows the progression of events. So yes, mechanism on the top, no mechanism on the bottom. But if you see these reaction conditions, you need to know that you make an anti-Markovnikov addition product. So if you're sort of like keeping track, you have now one reaction, hydrohalogenation, one route, Markovnikov product, the other route, anti-Markovnikov product. Are there any questions about hydrohalogenation? Okay, I think that big ass, oh, sorry. Big delivery truck is for me, so I might have to run outside in a minute, but I'm gonna let them get all set up. Okay, so 9.4. So 9.4 starts the um, hydration reactions. Okay, now the word hydration means to add water. Right, but we can't attach H2O to a compound. So what that means is that one carbon is going to get, oops, you can't see that. One carbon is going to get a hydrogen. The other compound or other carbon is going to get a hydroxide. Okay. So our product is an alcohol. There's three types of mechanisms that all fall under the category of hydration. Okay. So the first of the three is called acid catalyzed hydration. Okay. Acid catalyzed hydration will add water to make a Markovnikov product. And in terms of hydration, that means the OH is going to be on the more highly substituted vinylic carbon. And that delivery guy is for me, so hold on just a second, sorry. Hey, how are you? How are you? I'm good. Garage? Yes, please. I'll just open it and I'd like to sign anything or are you yes. just okay. You wanna sign it now? Sure. Do I have to look at it or no? I mean that's up that's up to you. Yeah, it's not. That's your stuff. <laughs> you wanna look at it? Yeah, yeah. you don't you don't have to. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> okay. All, All right, right, I'll meet you over there. Okay, sounds good. So I'm actually um, teaching an online class right now. So I'm going to open the garage, okay. and then when you move it in and you're ready for me to look at it, just pound on the garage door and I'll come back out. Okay. All right. All right, let me open the garage, y'all. Sorry.
Sorry. Okay. So we're going to start with now uh, an asymmetric alkene. So we know that this reaction has to end up with the hydroxide here because that's the more highly substituted carbon of the two vinylic carbons in the, in the bunch. Okay, so we're going to do this in sulfuric acid and water. And this combination is going to generate the hydronium cation. Okay. I'm really sorry, guys. He's fast delivery. He's going to pound on my door in a minute. Right. Okay. High electrons go and grab a proton. Sigma electrons go on to the oxygen. Okay. I'm only making one new sigma bond. That's here. Okay. So my tertiary carbon in the vinylic substrate is going to end up with a carbyl cation on it. And now this hydrogen is bonded here. There was one that I didn't draw, now there's two that I'm not drawing. Okay. This step released water. Which will attack a carbocation to make a protonated alcohol, okay? This oxygen is not happy being positively charged and it's pulling on electrons in the bonds, which are going to make these hydrogens out on the side much more partially positive. You have plenty of water in this system to grab a proton and bring electrons down to that oxygen. So your final product then is an alcohol and you've regenerated your hydronium cation, so it's catalyzed. So when something is catalyzed, you have a reagent that goes in that comes out in the same structure. So the hydronium was used and then regenerated. So that's a catalyst and your product here is the alcohol. Now, what I want us to think about a little bit is that there are some limitations to this reaction. Okay. The first is that you need high temperatures, like on the order of 250 Celsius. That's really hot. These reactions and this mechanism are much more suited to industrial purposes than academic or research purposes. The second is that you go through the carbocation intermediate, okay. which can cause two problems. The first problem is that carbocations can rearrange. Okay. The second problem is that your carbocation is sp2 hybridized. Okay, so if we draw that, and now we're going to look at it from the side. When this water, oh, here it is. When this water attacks, it can attack from the top or the bottom. Okay. If these groups are different, 
you're going to get a mixture of enantiomers. And the same would have been true for the hydrohalogenation reaction. Okay. Okay. So are there questions about this before we talk a little bit more about um, this situation and some of the um, limitations with stereochemistry and rearrangements? So for both um, hydrohalogenation, okay, he's ready for me. I'll be right back. All right, so hydrohalogenation, y'all hate me today. I hate, I hate it too, I'm sorry. Hydrohalogenation and acid catalyzed hydration. Okay. The limitations of the re this reaction are in the stereochemical outcomes. And we did already draw that, but just to have it with the other limitation. So since carbocations are sp2 trigonal planar, attack occurs with 50-50 likelihood to the top lobe or the bottom lobe of that P atomic orbital. Okay. So if the R groups off the carbocation are different, you will always get racemization. And that's the process of making a racemic mixture. And the racemic mixture is the 50-50 mix of enantiomers. Okay. If you do these reactions, you cannot avoid this. It's, if it is going to form a chiral product, you have to show both enantiomers. The second, again, is with um, rearrangements. If a carb, uh, carbocation can rearrange, it will. And I'll show you an example of that. So for example, if we take this substrate and we add it to HCl. Okay, so this is a hydrohalogenation reaction. We're going to use the pi electrons to make a sigma bond to the hydrogen and release chloride. This is a primary carbon. This is a secondary carbon. 
So the initial placement of the carbocation will be here. And you'd still have chloride here. Okay. This secondary carbocation will have a hydride shift to form a tertiary carbocation faster than the nucleophilic attack. So you'll form your tertiary carbocation, then perform the nucleophilic attack and make your tertiary alkyl halide. Now in this case, because you have two methyls, it's not chiral. Um, but if I had a propyl on here or something else, it would have ended up chiral. So you would have had a rearrangement and a mixture of enantiomers as products. Okay, so we can't do anything about this. Or you can say you can't do anything to fix these issues with hydrohalogenation. Okay. You just have to deal with them. We can fix them with the hydration. Okay. So we're going to look at two different hydration reactions that do not involve racemization and do not affect rearrangements. Are there are questions about the limitations before we look at the two other hydration reactions. Okay. All right. So in hydration, we have oops, we have three reactions. Okay. The first was acid catalyzed. Okay. The second, which is what we're going to look at now, is called oxymercuration. With a demercuration. Both of these add by Markovnikov addition. Okay, so you always will make the more highly substituted alcohol as a product. The limitations in acid catalyzed hydration, which are racemization and carbocation rearrangement, both of those um, are avoided completely in oxymercuration, demercuration. So we're going to draw out the reaction and then we'll do the mechanism. So we're gonna take an alkene and step one is the oxymercuration step. The oxymercuration step uses a mercury acetate salt. So mercury is HG. And you make an intermediate that has the hydroxide in the correct position, but the other vinylic or this other carbon that had been in the pi bond ends up with a mercury acetate group that you have to take off in the step demercuration. So in the demercuration step, you use a compound which is a reductant. It's called sodium borohydride. And it's basically a hydrogen source. And then what you make 
is your alcohol product. Okay, so again, this is sodium borohydride. So you get hydrides out of there. Hydrogens with lone pairs. Okay, and again, this is mercury acetate. Okay. The first step, which is going from here to here, you need to know the mechanism. Here to here, no mechanism. And a lot of this isn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a complete mechanism, but we're going to, there's parts of it that you should, you should know. So your alkene substrate reacts with the mercury acetate. And what you make is you have the, your carbon backbone and both of the carbons that are originally in the alkene end up over here bonded to a mercury acetate, okay, in like a triangle. This species is called the mercurinium ion. and it cannot rearrange. Now this mercury is being asked to carry a positive charge and when things are charged, they tend to pull electrons towards them. Okay, so the mercury atom has two sigma bonds that it can pull from, which is gonna build up positive electron den or positive density, charge density at this carbon and positive charge density at this carbon. This is a primary carbon. This is a secondary carbon. A secondary carbon can hold a partially positive charge better than a primary carbon. So you get a partially positive buildup here at this carbon which can be attacked by water. Okay. And remember, you always have plenty of water in your system in order to do these proton transfers. So water will grab a proton, sigma electrons will go to the oxygen to get rid of that formal charge. We end up with our alcohol in the correct place and then all we have to do at the end is treat that compound or that species with the sodium borohydride and we end up with our alcohol product. Are there questions about oxymercuration, demercuration, and what parts you need to know? Okay. The last of the hydration reactions is called hydroboration. oxidation. Okay. When you do the hydroboration oxidation, you make the anti-Markovnikov product, so the less highly substituted alcohol. 
of the cough. Okay. Now we're going to use for hydroboration, we're going to use um, a cyclic substrate because this adds by thin addition. Okay. Before we do that, we're going to write it out um, just with a simple or a, a linear alkene uh, because it's a two-step reaction and I need to tell you a little bit about how you have to write two-step reactions. Okay. So you have an alkene substrate. Okay. And then the way it's written, since it's two steps, Step one has to have a one in front of it. And you'd have to completely do step one before you could finish step two. Step one, you treat your alkene with boron trihydride. And then the dot just means in a solution of THF. So that's that tetrahydroforane. In step two, you treat your intermediate with peroxide under basic conditions. Okay. You are required to list these as separate steps. And your product is the least highly substituted alcohol. Now, step one, you need to be able to get to the intermediate, but there's no reaction. There's no arrows involved. It's just you have these two compounds. You have to be able to draw the intermediate structure, and then you would have no details, no mechanism. This is a radical reaction. So you'll have no mechanism here. Okay. All right. So down here, I'm actually going to slide this up so I can have more room by getting rid of the three types. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a cyclopentene but so that we can have differentiation between our vinylic carbons one of these will have a hydrogen and the other is going to have a methyl group and I want you to draw all the hydrogens in the methyl group because this will give you an idea of the size of this group and why the presence of this group will get you to the anti-Markovnikov product. So if we'll, we'll, do, we'll draw it in two directions, here and here, but both of these represent step one. So BH3 in THF. Okay. So if we try to draw or try to have Markovnikov addition, which would put the hydroxide here, what you would have to have is an intermediate okay, hydrogen, C, H, H, H. Okay, now the way this is drawn is going to look weird because I'm going to use a dotted line because, and make a square. And what that dotted line represents is like the electron density holding these four things together. Down in this corner, hydrogen. Over here, 
boron with two hydrogens. So here's the BH3. This here is steric crowding. So this doesn't happen. For this reaction to proceed, your intermediate has to have the hydrogen donated by the boron trihydride. So this hydrogen here comes from this reactant. So this hydrogen from the boron trihydride ends up on, this, on the more highly substituted carbon from your substrate because you can avoid steric crowding at this point. Okay. This then becomes this species, and then when you treat with peroxide in base in step two, you end up with your hydroxide in the place of your BH2 group. And this is still the hydrogen from the boron trihydride. So now your alcohol is on the less substituted carbon. This is a secondary carbon. This is a tertiary carbon. So your hydroxide ends up on the less highly substituted group. Does anybody mind if I erase the reaction and the formation of this sort of cage structure intermediate, um, so I can draw or make a couple other notes. Okay. okay. Now one thing you have to consider in here, this is asymmetric, and what I have shown over here is that both of the groups added to the bottom. Both of the groups could have added to the top. So when I draw my products, it's actually going to end up, here's one of them, with the hydroxide, we'll say down, and the hydrogen from the boron trihydride down, and then this methyl group up. And since we have 50-50 likelihood of reaction occurring on the top, I have it showing reaction occurring on the bottom, you're going to make this product. So these are a mixture of enantiomers because they're opposite at both chiral centers. And both are equally formed throughout the course of the reaction. Okay. All right, 
Are there questions about that reaction? So now you have five reactions so far. Okay, does anybody um, need this up any longer or can I erase this slide? Okay, so I'm going to erase this, and before I go on, I forgot to write a couple things up here with these. So the acid catalyzed hydration, this is 9.3 in your book. Wait, no, I lied, 9.4, I think. Yeah, 9.4. Oxymercuration, demercuration is 9.5. Hydroboration is 9.6. Questions so far? You're going to love the next one, I promise. Okay. All right, 9.7. This is called catalytic hydrogenation. Okay. This is addition of H and H. So each of the carbons in the alkene just gets a hydrogen. Okay. This occurs by syn addition. So the two hydrogens add to the same phase. Okay. Yes, Oh, no problem. I didn't know you could use the copies. Well, I just bought them the other day. And I was like, oh, can I have these? You got 36. Okay, so you have your alkene substrate, and then you use hydrogen, and that would be in the gas state. But what you need is a reactive surface. And so reactive surfaces are things like platinum. You could use palladium. You could use nickel. Um, sometimes these are written and supported by carbon. So that would be like PT slash C, so platinum on a, pl on, platinum on a carbon surface. And these reactions go 100% to product, where you have, in this case, just an alkane. Okay. So the way this works is you have a surface, a flat surface. Okay. And then I'm just going to draw a couple. So these flat surfaces are made of these atoms of palladium or nickel, whatever have you, okay? So then off of these atoms, you get the hydrogens attached by single bonds. So the source of these is hydrogen gas, okay? But the hydrogen interacts with the metal. And there, adsorbed, not absorbed, adsorbed to the surface. So they just kind of are sitting on the surface of the metal. Okay. So then your alkene is going to float down and one of the hydrogens attaches first and then the other end is like hanging on for dear life and then that breaks away and you have your product so the um, alkene sort of lays down on the reactive surface 
and the hydrogens are transferred one at a time. This is the easiest thing. You just find your alkenes and add hydrogens to them. But you have to be careful. So when, what I mean by that is, let's say you have this substrate. Okay. Um, so this is a, uh, it's called 2-cyclohexenone, because it's got a hex, it has a double bond and a ketone. Okay. And if you do this reaction with hydrogen over your reactive surface, the only thing you're allowed to do the reaction on is the alkene component. You have to leave the ketone alone. And, and that's true for most of your other um, substrates. So let's say here we have a benzene ring, an alkene, and then an ester and we do this reaction, hydrogen over nickel. We can't do reactions in benzene. We don't know reactions of esters. The only thing you can do is do a hydrogenation at the ketone, uh, excuse me, at the alkene. Let's say you have, A nitrile, hydrogen over nickel. The only thing you can reduce is the alkene. Okay. So when you're doing these reactions, okay, find your alkenes. Okay, and leave the rest alone. Okay, are there questions about this reaction? Nine point eight. Okay, so halo, sorry, halogenation. Okay, so eight is halogenation and halo hydrin. And we're going to start with the halogenation. Okay. Halogenation is the addition of X2. So you can use bromine and chlorine. Okay. You can't use iodine I2 for this. The reaction is too slow. It's not useful. The reaction of fluorine is so fast and exothermic, it's a violent reaction. So you can only do these reactions with chlorine and bromine. These add by anti-addition. So if your substrate is cyclic, you're going to end up with one adding on the top face, the second adding on the bottom face. Okay. So I'll draw out the reaction up here and then we'll do the mechanism. So um, actually. And what you would write is just Br2. And again, there's nothing written underneath here. It's just your alkene in the presence of bromine. Since they add anti, you're going to get enantiomers. Okay. 
Now the reaction for this is not terribly difficult, but you have to keep track of everything. So here is your, actually let me draw that so that it looks flat again. Oh, it killed my marker here. Now I'm going to show the bromine on the bottom face coming from the bottom side, but only because it's easier to draw than coming from the top face. And the way I'm going to draw my bromine is I'm going to draw it linear as a diatomic, but like in a north-south orientation. So pi electrons come and grab the bromine and the bromine electrons come back up to the carbon. Okay. This bromine breaks off as bromide. Okay. Now at this point, you don't have a pi bond anymore because both of your carbons are bonded on the bottom side to this bromine, which is carrying a positive formal charge. This is called the bromonium ion. Okay. If you use chlorine, this would look exactly the same, only this would be called the chloro, wait, I always spell that wrong, the chlorinium. Ion. Okay. And the bromide is out here in solution. Now, this bromine is a big atom, and so it's blocking the entire bottom side of the cyclopropane ring. So this bromine attack has to come from the side opposite where this bromine is. So then the electrons in the sigma bond will go to the bromine so that you don't have a positive charge, a formal charge on your bromine anymore. And then you'd end up like this. Okay. Now this substrate is symmetric. So these two carbons are the same. If one of them was substituted, like there had been a CH3 group here, then it matters which of the carbons you attack. So the bromine, or this brominium ion with a bromine with a positive charge is gonna pull on electron density in these dash bonds. That's gonna build up positive charge density at these two carbons, and a tertiary partially positive carbon is more stable than a secondary partial positive carbon. When this bromide comes from the top to attack, it pushes, now in this case, the methyl down. And now you can always at this point just write EN because you're forming a mixture of enantiomers. All right. Are there questions about this reaction? Okay. So the next one is the formation of a halohydrin. 
And a halo hydrin is the addition of a halogen and a hydroxide. Okay. These will use bromine or chlorine and add by anti-addition. The difference in forming a halogenation product is that you have your halogen over a nothing indicated. So there's no solvent indicated. There'd be a solvent, it just is not really ever marked. This case, you're going to have your halogen, but it's going to be over water. Okay. So the reaction is actually going to proceed in the same way as the halogenation reaction did in the first step. We'll use chlorine this time. Okay. And we're going to make it um, asymmetric. Okay, so now we're going to use chlorine in the presence of water. And so again, underneath, just because it's easier to draw, we'll put our chlorine diatomic molecule. The sigma electrons come get the chlorine, a chlorine comes back up. This will break off as chloride. So I have this attack on the bottom, which means this methyl group is gonna pop up. It's gonna get pushed up due to the presence of that chlorine on, on the underside of the ring. So here's the chlorinium ion. And now you have chloride and you have water in solution. Oops. Okay. The concentration of water is gigantic relative to the concentration of the chloride. So the most likely collision is going to be between the chlorinium cation and water. Okay. Now when you look at these two carbons, this carbon is tertiary and will be better at stabilizing a partially positive charge than this one. Okay. So the water will attack from the top to that carbon and push the chloride off. Okay. This methyl group is going to flip from pointing up to pointing down. It's going to get pushed down. We make this intermediate, and then you use another water molecule to deprotonate. And then, of course, you'll make your enantiomer. We made so much progress today, guys. This is awesome. So um, we will finish 9 tomorrow and do problems. So uh, are there any questions? I, I want to kind of map out the next bit of time because we have only have five lectures left. Okay, I know today was probably a little overwhelming. The reactions, uh, it's just reactions from here on out. Um, so let's see, today is 
the 11th. So Friday is the 12th. Monday is the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20, 21. Monday is the 22nd. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to finish nine. We can do practice problems and we can start 10 if we have time. Oh, and the discussion is due. Okay. Monday the 15th, we'll review for the exam and keep on working in chapter 10. Now chapter 10 is reactions of all kinds. So we're gonna do addition reactions to things with triple bonds. So the better you understand nine, the easier 10 will be. 16th, chapter 10 and 11, 17th, 11th, and 12th, thir the Thursday, the 12th. So chapter, the 18th would be chapter 12. Chapter 12 is just really putting everything together. So after we finish nine, we really only, excuse me, have two chapters of new material before we get into the summary chapter. Now this is reading day, and we don't have class on reading day. And then your final is on Monday the 22nd. Now, this final, our time slot is 8 to 11 a.m. Okay. Now, the exam will open Sunday, June 21st at 8 a.m. So you have 27 hours of access in order to take this exam, but it's due by Monday at 11 a.m. Okay, so hopefully within that time, y'all should be okay. Within 20, some 27 hours, you should be able to find time to take the exam. The final is 50 multiple choice, and it's pretty as evenly distributed across all the material as possible. So that is the rest of the term. Are there any questions? Will we have a review day for the final at all? Uh, that would really be up to you guys. I'm certainly um, willing, I, I'm trying to think. Um, that weekend, that Sunday, the 21st is Father's Day. So Sunday, may not be the best day for me. I've, I'll have to ask my husband what he, if he wants to do anything. Um, but that obviously wouldn't take all day. But so Sunday night, possibly, depends on what's going on. But we can either meet, we could meet Friday, like during class, we could meet, or we could find something on the weekend. So um, I think we're in really good shape to have time at the end to review, but I, I don't mind doing an extra review if you all want to. You just kind of have to let me know. All right, thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there aren't any other questions, there are office hours tonight. Um, I have a Zoom meeting um, right before office hours, it's from three to five. So if I'm a little late, that's what's going on. I'm finishing up things in that other meeting, and, but I'll be there. Um, and other than that, if you guys need anything today, let me know. I'll be around by email and um, I will talk to you guys soon. See you tomorrow. Have a good one. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Yep, you're welcome. Have a good day.